Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, very interesting panel, which we are taking up with the dermatologist now. We have had a brilliant uh, panel discussion moderated by Pia, who's a convener of this program. And we've had uh, a brilliant panel who has, uh, who has answered a whole lot of uh, uh, questions, which are, uh, uh, you know, sort of usual questions which people put up to us. Uh, in short, we will now go on to the dermat part of it because we see all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, different kinds of patients and different kind of questions we come up with. And therefore, in that case now, I'm going to talk about what we need to do for those who have a problem with, um, uh, with uh, their dermat issues. So let me just share my screen with you. Just give me half a minute and I will be with you. Oh, it's going crazy. Okay. So uh, let me go on to telling you a little bit about what really is PCOS and dermatological problems or dermatoendocrinology as we call it today. Uh, we know that uh, PCOS and dermatological manifestations form a very intricate interconnecting network, which comprises many factors. And most of them, of course, are due to chronic inflammation, hormones, and genetics. If you look at this very nice study done by the uh, American, uh, taking into account the American experience uh, published by Anuja Dokras in Fertility Sterility, she wanted to know what is the knowledge of physicians on PCOS. And what she found is she, after doing a survey of OBGYNs who were practicing infertility and those who were not, where 630 completed the survey of which 70% were uh, regular OBGYNs and 30% were fertility specialists and 64.4% of them were female specialists. She found that almost one fourth of them did not know which diagnostic criteria they had used to diagnose PCOS. The fertility specialists use the Rotterdam criteria twice as often as the regular OBGYNs. 85% were aware of the comorbidities which go with issues related to PCOS. And there were fewer OBGYNs who were aware of depression, anxiety disorders, and reduced quality of life. More fertility specialists recommended lifestyle changes versus OBGYNs, almost to the tune of almost 10 to 15% less in OBGYNs. Whilst we did a Mumbai experience wherein we looked at the knowledge about PCOS diagnosis and management, this is done through the PCOS Abhyan, which is a group created by, the, uh, by a collaboration of the PCOS Society of India with the Institute for Research in Reproduction in Mumbai and Tata Institute of Social Sciences and the Kasulba Medical Center. So we carried out a survey between family physicians and specialists and the specialists included gynecologists, dermatologists, and endocrinologists. We had 100 of each, and the 300 rest of them were uh, from the family physician level from all three fields of uh, 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 family physicians, that's Ayurveda, homeopathy, and allopaths. And what was found, I cannot divulge the results completely now because the paper has just gone in for publication, but I can tell you one thing that there was a lot of uh, issues found in terms of knowledge of the specialists and the physicians themselves. Of course, the specialists were better informed than the, phys by the, than the family physicians. But at the same time, overall, looking at a PCO patient was not complete by either of the specialists. Of course, it matters a lot when a patient comes to us. Say, for example, if a patient has come to me for infertility or menstrual dysfunction, probably I would focus only on that. But there are some of us who would also evaluate the other aspects of it besides only treating infertility. As a matter of fact, I was asked in one panel discussion that if at all you are dealing with infertility, why are you doing the other test 
to know whether there is any other issue. So, so this is something which we must all remember that we have to treat patient as a whole and not only manage her local problem. So in short, we need to target the knowledge of all the internationally accepted Rotterdam criteria in order to make a good diagnosis. We need to make sure that there's consistent care as suggested by evidence-based guidelines and all PCOS women should be completely monitored and managed across the entire reproductive period of their lives. It should not end with only treating the symptom the patient has come to with us. And hence, early pre intervention to prevent is absolutely necessary to prevent long-term consequences such as insulin resistance, cardiovascular disorders, metabolic disorders, infertility, depression, cancer, and poor quality of life. So if we wish to uh, really help our patients of course, as the previous panel said, that we need to educate our patients, but we also need to educate the physicians. And that has been an agenda with us. And hence, I think this, this panel discussion today is an extremely uh, important panel discussion wherein we are going to have a discussion on healthy skin. And we have excellent panelists with us uh, who are dermatologists. And uh, I will introduce them one by one. We have Dr. Anil Ganju. I'm introducing him first because we always say ladies first, but here we have three women and one man. So I thought it's better I introduce the guy first. So Dr. Anil Ganju, who's a recipient of the prestigious Dr. Sardari Lal Memorial Lifetime Achievement Award. He also has an Economic Times Inspiring Dermatologist of the Year 2019. Besides that, he's received many other awards. He's a heads the Department of Dermatology in several prestigious Delhi institutions. He's a president of SARC and past vice president of IADBL and the scientific chair of aesthetics and he's also authored chapters and he's reviewer of the AXI journal. Then we have Dr. Nina Madnani, who's a consultant dermatologist, dermatologist at the PD Hinduja Hospital and the Sir HN Reliance Hospital in Mumbai. And she's also the SIG uh, coordinator for female genital disease and has established the first vulvar clinic in India. Uh, Nina has uh, several best practicing dermatologist awards in uh, many awards she's received and she's also the uh, WCD speaker and has a Dr. Scatter Le Lectorship Award. So in short, her focus has been on various issues, but she's well known for her, um, for her center, which she has developed as the first vulva clinic in India. Then we have Dr. Malvika Kohli, who's the director of Skin Secrets, which is a dermatology and aesthetic center par excellence located in South and North Mumbai. She's a course coordinator for MCAS India, and she's also been the board member of the Indian Acne Alliance. She's a masterclass trainer for injectables and devices around the globe. She has authored various chapters in textbooks, and she's also a judge for the Vogue Beauty Awards. So we, the last uh, panelist I want to discuss is our youngest panelist, Dr. Karishma Balani, and she also is involved in her area of interest is uh, PCOS and uh, doing all um, uh, lasers and anti-aging uh, therapies like uh, Botox, threads, fillers, etc. And she's a member of various organizations, including the PCOS Society of India and the American Academy of Aesthetic Medicine. So this is one thing I would like um, all of you to know that the PCOS Society is open to all the disciplines of medicine, which deal with management of PCOS. And in short, it's not that we want only the physicians, but we're also looking at the uh, associate uh, memberships of people who are nutritionists, who are, uh, who are uh, exercise therapists, et cetera, et cetera. So we go on to our discussion today and we'll uh, have uh, the panelists joining in. And I would like to, uh, uh, first of all, discuss regarding acne. Uh, when we go to acne, in short, I would like to first of all ask uh, uh, the question, I'm trying to get the screen so that I can see the panelists. Unfortunately, I'm not seeing the panelists. Uh, one moment. No, unless you sh stop sharing, you cannot see the room. Oh, I know. So uh, I wanted to 
show these pictures to everyone. So I think I will stop sharing and then we'll just talk about the, about the symptoms. Just, uh, let me just finish with this and then I'll go to the uh, actually so that I don't have to screen share again. What I'll do is that uh, after, after I share with this, with the certain statements which uh, PCOS Society of India has created a consensus statement on the use of oral contraceptive pills in PCOS women in India. And this is something which I recommend all of you to read because this is something which talks about all the, all the uh, you know, possible ways in which you could use OC pills, whom to use it for, not to use it for, contraindications, indications, et cetera, et cetera. And this was a, a collaboration with other organizations too, led by the PCOS Society of India. And we had uh, seven eight to eight other organizations with us on this, which was also including the NIRRH, the Endocrine Society of India, the IADVL, the uh, Indian Society for Assisted Reproduction, the uh, IADVL, then the Department of OBGYN University Colleges and the Indian College of OBGYN and the Mumbai OBGYN Society. The working group was quite a few. We had about 25 people working on this. And the other thing I want to bring out is that the recommendations from the International Base Evidence-Based Guideline for the assessment and management of PCOS is something which we all need to read. It's brilliant. It's a 200 page document which talks about every aspect of PCOS. And I'm happy to share with you that out of the 37 organizations which were invited to participate in this development or this collaboration, the PCOS Society of India was one of them besides Foxy being involved. So we have uh, various uh, programs uh, related, to, uh, related to PCOS. And besides having that, we also have the newsletter and the, and the uh, you know, we were talking about patient awareness and we do have patient awareness too. Uh, let me go out into the Zoom now and then we can discuss. What do Okay, so now we are uh, back to our uh, screen. Uh, I would request all the others who are on the screen to switch off their videos and to switch off their uh, mute themselves so that we can carry on with the discussion. Now, what I want to go on first with, I want to go on first with discussing acne. Following acne, I will discuss hirsutism, and then we will discuss alopecia, and then we will discuss acanthosis. I think these are the common areas which need discussion, and this is something which are very, very uh, um, prestigious dermatologists who have been involved in managing these patients will come in. Um, so first of all, let me talk about um, acne. Um, Malvika, can I start with you? Sure. If you have an adolescent girl coming to you and she's got acne, how do you know whether this acne is due to adolescence or is it due to PCOS? How do you determine the difference between the two? Thank you, Dr. Durusha, for having me here and amongst my esteemed panelists. And thank you, the PCOS Society, for organizing this wonderful session uh, in, and the entire session of today covering so many aspects of PCOS. You're right, we begin and end our day with PCOS at the clinic. And that's because it has so many ramifications and shades of gray. Uh, this is particularly true in the adolescent group, as you said. And yes, it is sometimes, uh, you know, with, with experience, one has learned that a lot of adolescent acne could either be the beginning as a sign of emerging or developing PCOS. It could be transient to do with natural pubertal, post-pubertal adolescent hormones, or it could actually be PCOS manifesting for the first time as acne. So it is at 14, a wait and watch game, especially if the girl has got a menarche at 12, but if the girl has got a menarche at around 10, then one really begins to wonder whether, you know, this is a really PCOS already. 
Of course, as we all know, there's a role of genetics and there's a role of inflammation. And today, a lot of inflammation is coming from androgens, uh, as well as from the diet, because the kids of today are following the Western diet, saturated fats, sugary foods. So this uh, activating the COXO1 and the mTOC1 pathway, leading to activation of bacteria. So there is a lot of pathways between genetics, inflammation, diet, and lifestyle, which we do see along with stress in a 14-year-old. So I would like to counsel the parents, and also I talk directly to the child. I do realize that, you know, uh, with acne, with hirsutism, and with androgenetic alopecia, it's a long journey. You've got to walk the road together. So you have to develop a very good relationship in the first contact point with your patients so that you start counseling them. They walk with you down that path. It's, there's no quick fix out here. So once they, you know, you build that relationship and bond and you explain to them that this could be just adolescence. There may be an underlying PCOS background. You may have to test the hormones. I would say that do, do the conventional acne therapy, failing which you may then want to look at hormones unless there are already signs of hirsutism, hair loss, excessive dandruff, and other signs of PCOS, which could then lead us to want to test earlier. But at 14, even if you do tests, again, the interpretation of them has a gray zone. So I think a wait and watch, and then if it's stubborn, not following the treatment guidelines and relapsing, then we would start investigating. Absolutely. So Dr. Anil, what would you do if you have a young girl coming to you, she's 13, 14, she's got a lot of acne, and you are uh, not sure whether it's adolescent, would you start investigating right away or you would use conventional therapy as Malika said? And when would you take the decision to further investigate her? Uh, investigations have to wait uh, because in early menarche, uh, unless the things have settled down, investigations are not warranted one. But uh, uh, PCOS has become so common in our patients that our questionnaire for uh, you know taking history has has evolved, and uh, we now ask every acne patient of ours about uh, menstrual history, about premenstrual flares, about severity of acne, about history of acne in their pa parents, and how bad it has been. So all this keeping in mind that there could be a possible hormonal angle to it. And uh, if we do come across any of these, uh, even if we don't investigate, then we try and you know look into the possible. Uh, hormonal issues that could be there if the patient is very obese so at least give them some you know uh, unconventional insulin sensitizers to start with you know uh, like s style cysteine like uh, vitamin d uh, these kind of things and if we have to investigate we of course have to wait and we start treating the patient and keeping it in, keeping in mind that if there are premenstrual flares if, if there are irregular cycles particularly in a patient who has who has at least two to three four years past menarche I feel two years past Minaki, one, one should be ready to go ahead with tests if, you, if it really warrants clinically. So uh, I do tests if we are more than two years past Minaki and I suspect that there is some hormonal disturbance. <coughs> and right in the beginning, if I feel that the hormones are stimulating the acne, I do you know, look into the hormonal aspect of treatment because unless I do that, my acne is not going to respond. Absolutely. So in short, uh, you know, when it's a young girl, we would like to wait. We would probably wait for at least two years post menarche before thinking of uh, giving her any kind of hormonal therapy, which is a good uh, suggestion. But in the meantime, Nina, what do you use as conventional therapy? So we have patients who come to us. We would like to know, okay, what should we offer them in the meantime? Of course, we would refer to the dermatologist, but at least something we can start with. Mic is off. You're on mute, Nina. Uh, Nina? You're on mute. I think she's on. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So an adolescent who comes to us with acne, uh, after, like Dr. Anil said, you take a big history, then of course we are going to start treatment. Depending on how severe the acne is, if it's just mild, the child has just started getting some seborrhea, the child has started getting some closed and open comedones, then we would start on with a topical retinoid. We could add on a combination of a benzoyl peroxide and a clindamycin, and we would observe the child because these are slow acting modalities, and we'd see how they do. 
you don't expect a miracle in one, two weeks. It takes time. It takes at least four to six weeks before you see some change. Counsel the patient that this is going to be a lot of hand-holding because we need to know how her hormones are behaving vis-a-vis -vis her skin. Because adolescents have a lot of ups and downs with their hormonal surges, depending on their stresses, what they are eating. So we'd start with topical. If she has very inflammatory, where I grade her into the moderate, if I find that she's scarring, I would add on a topical, I would add on a systemic agent, like a systemic antibiotic, like doxycycline. We used to use a lot of azithromycin, but now we are going away from it because of the resistance of the propionibacterium acne. So we use doxycycline. Again, doxycycline, parents get very uh, shocked when we are giving doxycycline because they say it's an antibiotic. How can you give it for so long? So again, you talk to them that this is an international protocol. So we'll give them doxycycline, we'll give them topical uh, retinoids, and we will give them topical either benzoyl peroxide or clindamycin. We try not to give them only topical clindamycin because again, you're uh, helping the resistant bacteria. You're stimulating resistance of the QT, it's called QT bacterium acne now, not propioni bacterium anymore. So we what? do that and pardon? I said acne vulgaris is something which... Acne vulgaris is what we use as a term, as a medical term. So the moment we tell the kids you have acne vulgaris, oh, <laughs> acne, it's never going to clear. So I have to tell them it's a synonym for pimples. Acne is a synonym for pimples. So we have to calm them down. Absolutely. So that's how I would address. And then if they fail, if they fail and we find that it's getting worse, they have irregular periods, they have hirsutism, they've started getting alopecia, then I would start, my uh, brain would start ticking in terms of hormonal, uh, you know, evaluation. Okay. Just a general question, whoever wishes to answer. Basically, if you have a patient coming with acne, how many dermatologists really would fully examine a patient to see whether there's any other issue anywhere else on the body or only look at the acne and treat? No, no, most of us. No. I think most of us. All of us. We look at all. Yeah, would yeah. do it for sure. It's imperative. It's, imperative. Yeah. it's a complete yeah. examination. Complete examination. To look for any other issues. So suppose, uh, Karishma, you have a patient yes. who comes to you and uh, you, know, you see a lot of acne and you're also trying to look for any kind of hirsutism or something which is associated with it. So mm -hmm. uh, which score system are you doing with scoring or are you generally uh, using any kind of methodology of assessing the hirsutism? Am I audible? Yeah, yes. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm audible. Ma'am, first, I would just like to go back to your first question regarding investigations in a patient with acne at the age of 14. Because I have seen a couple of girls who've come to me at the age of 13 and 14, and they've been obese. And I have seen acanthosis nigricans in them. I have asked for serum insulin level. The fasting and the post-lunch, uh, I have almost found levels almost up to 200 and 300. And we've like started them on metformin at a very early stage and we've really seen very good improvement. So yeah. is there associated, yeah. can you hear me? Which levels are you talking about? The uh, serum insulin level, ma'am. If the, if the girl is obese and there's presence of uh, acanthosis nigricans, so yes. we ask for a serum insulin level. Maybe I may not ask for all the, all the other hormonal tests which we would have otherwise asked for hyperandrogenemia. But insulin levels, finding them high and starting metformin at an early stage has really helped them and maybe then they may not develop all the overt signs of PCOS later on. But and of course then we keep a regular follow-up. We keep a regular follow-up. Yes. And now uh, since you're talking about doing insulin levels, um, yeah. are you doing only fasting insulin or are you also doing... Uh, uh, fasting insulin, post-lunch insulin because uh, I, I read in one of the books that the post-lunch insulin rises before the fasting insulin. So it's always better to do a fasting and a post-lunch insulin so doing, level. But suppose you see, I know I'm mixing up acanthosis here, since you talked about insulin yeah. resistance. Yeah. If you do see patients with acanthosis, in agriculture, yeah. then yes. would you do an insulin level? Sorry, ma'am, if I didn't get your question. If you see your patient having clinical signs of insulin resistance yeah. in the form yeah. of acanthosis, Yes. Then that is a clinical sign of insulin. Yes, ma'am. 
that we understand but for our patients to understand because they have to be on a drug metformin which is an anti diabetic drug for a good amount of time so it's very important to document it and then you start so that you know long term they adhere to that they have a good compliance otherwise they generally don't like to take any anti diabetic medication unless they have the report in front of their eyes yes i totally agree with you it's a fact that yeah. you do not accept it when you tell them verbally but at the same time we must realize that uh, basically the guidelines say that if there is clinical evidence of insulin resistance insulin resistance or yeah. also obese it's a yes. good idea to even start with uh, metformin there's metformin. no Uh, at what age, youngest, have you started with uh, metformin? Anyway. Thirteen, thirteen, thirteen years, ma'am. I've started for a girl, thirteen year old. I have started at ten. Yes, yeah. because she came with striae. She didn't come with acne. She came with striae, yes. and because she was prepubertal, so she came with severe striae dystensia, the red ones. So I started at had to start at ten. So, so coming back to acne is, um, you know, we know that acne gets corrected very well with even oral contraceptive pills, and they are also very useful for women who have got uh, irregular periods. So, as a matter of fact, that's like one com one drug which helps both the issues. So, in short, we do put a, a put a lot of our patients as gynecologists on oral contraceptive pills. but there are certain pills we would not want to give and certain pills we would want to give in those patients which are the pills which are most popular with the dermatologist which ones do you like to use pyrolactone we are very happy with pyrolactone no no the pills we are we are more into dian yasmin where we have okay. low uh, estrogen uh, pills with uh, with a uh, low androgenic potential prost uh, progestogen so uh, dine with cyproter uh, with uh, ethanol estradiol uh, and cyproterone estate okay. and yasmin with uh, drosperinone are the ones that we uh, give these are more uh, helpful in acne because they have low androgenic potential the ones uh, that gynecologists mostly use is mostly for fertility and regu regularization of the periods which may have uh, more androgenic potential so yes. uh, that's the difference we we avoid those and give these No, I agree with you that yes, uh, we would prefer to use non-androgenic uh, uh, progestins because when we use estrogen and progesterone, we know that the estrogen is usually the same, estradiol, but the progesterone there are four generation of progesterones, yes. and the fact that every one of them when it gets metabolized, it gets metabolized and it has a has a side effect which is either androgenic or it may be non-androgenic, and mm -hmm. drosperinone has been found to be the least androgenic, and therefore. Mm -hmm. for using that in women with acne and it really helps them a lot again the question comes up that when we have young girls whom we are giving oral contraceptive pills for a long time there's a long there's a lot of apprehension by the mothers yeah. that you're giving hormones to my to my daughter for a long time so malvika how do you convince the mothers yeah it is it is uh, well it it's easier nowadays than earlier and uh, i think if the periods are irregular your case is stronger of course there's a lot of counseling involved and merits demerits have to be discussed uh, i must say that i am a proponent that if the lifestyle modification especially if there's a higher insulin level and the patient is obese and even has irregular periods and has a very poor lifestyle i may actually to break the ice actually start them on a combination of metformin and spironolactone along with lifestyle modification and if it doesn't work then put them onto yasmin or cyproterone acetate with ethanol estradiol uh this also helps to break the ice this also makes them realize that you know the periods are not regularizing things are not settling down but if the case demands that they need to start on it then the first concern is that you know will they get dependent on it the second concern is Will it lead to infertility? In fact, they think the other way around that the pill will lead to infertility. And the third thing is that they want to know how long they have to take it. So these questions have to be. So then, very often, I must say that when I feel that there is a genuine case, I do always take the help of colleagues, my gynecologist colleagues like you. We share so many patients because of that. Is that I feel then it's a good idea for them to visit you. uh as a gynecologist and a gynecologist colleagues because 
this is really also your forte and i think it's important that they hear it from you as well uh, on the other hand if there's hirsutism and androgenetic alopecia and the need for an anti androgen then i may refer them to an endocrinologist colleague where the periods are regular then i and I refer them to an endocrinologist colleague. So I think it's all about teamwork. So I think metformin and aldactone will be my first choice. If I cannot give OCP, if OCP required resistance, take the help and create a team for the patient. It gives them a lot more reassurance. I agree with you. Again, with when we use pyronolactone for patients who are young girls who are not planning a pregnancy is fine, but when we give it to the older women who may get pregnant whilst they are on it, I think we need to combine the OCP because pyronolactone can cause harm to the developing fetus. And therefore, it's important for us to remember that in those women who are, uh, you know, could get pregnant inadvertently or they have to be told that they shouldn't get pregnant. And if they are not, you know, sort of having the, uh, having any contraindications to using the pill, then we need to tell them to avoid a pregnancy in other methods, use other methods to avoid a pregnancy. So in short, um, Nina, if you could tell us, you know, which are the, these will be the few last questions for acne and then we move on to hirsutism. Which are the patients you, you don't give the OC pill to? Are you comfortable giving OC pills to all your patients or there are certain tests you do or certain history you look into before you prescribe OC pills because it's Definitely. taken a pretty long time. I think uh, that's a very, very important question, which uh, a lot of uh, physicians do not ask these questions. One is definitely I would not give it to a person, a girl who's 35 and a smoker because of the hypercoagulability of the smoking. I would ask for a history uh, of a family history of a stroke in a younger parent or a family member. That's very important and ask for cancers in the family. That's the other thing. And uh, if a patient is very obese, it would be a word about giving the OCPs because they are, some of them would make them put on weight. So, and plus I would be, I would definitely not uh, give a OCP if I'm planning to give it for a long term without referring to the gynecologist who do a pap smear and see the baseline pap smear before we put the patient on the OCP. So uh, history taking, and the reason I'm telling you this is because I've had two young girls who came to me with acne and the first thing they told me is don't give me OCP. So I said, why? And one of them said, I've just recovered from a stroke. I was given an OCP. So I said, but uh, is there any family member who has had a stroke? She says, my father had a stroke at the age of 45. So I said, why did you not tell your physician administer? She said, she never asked me, so I didn't think it was important to tell her. So it's very important, the, this history taking, you know. I think, stroke, yeah, you're right. Even in younger people, we are seeing it in 25. Um, there seems to be some lag with your connection. Uh, so therefore, some of your words got cut off. But I think oh, it's oh, important. For us Sorry. to, to okay. also, uh, realize that uh, we need to examine the patient because I had one patient who was treated by a dermatologist and the patient had early breast cancer, I think. She was a young lady of 28 or 20, 30 and she took the pill and uh, she was never examined. The breast was never examined and then she came in with invasive breast cancer. So it was unfortunate that a very young lady, because when they are, have, you know, there's a, not that the OC pills caused the malignancy. It was the hormones which made the latent malignancy grow up further. So again, with examination, I think the breast should never be missed out. The breast examination has to be done before breast examination, a complete examination to make sure. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is only because I find that uh, uh, I'm not sure how, what percentage of dermatologists uh, are examining the patient completely or taking a full history. Based on the survey which was done recently, we found that only 25% of dermatologists are examining the patients completely. And that is the reason why I brought up this issue. So we move on to the next uh, topic is hirsutism, which is even again because of hyperandrogenemia. Uh, Dr. Anil, would you like to uh, let us know that uh, when you talk about uh, hirsutism and uh, when we talk about the Rotterdam criteria, 
uh, we say that it should be either clinical or biochemical hyperandrogenism. And it's a well-known fact that doing the hormone levels for androgens in the commercial uh, way is not enough because it does not, it's not good enough to give us the correct answer unless we are doing something like a free androgen index or a HOMA IR. So in short, we want to uh, know uh, what do you all do uh, in, in terms of trying to uh, evaluate a patient when she's hirsute as to how severe the hirsutism is. Do you go only by clinical examination or you still do all the tests? And which tests do you do? Uh, tests are depicted by the clinical examination. So clinical examination is very important. And if you fi find signs of number one, insulin resistance, if there are, uh, there's a history of uh, uh, menstrual disturbances, if, uh, if uh, the patient is obese, so you would investigate based upon these investigations and a basic investigation profile is done in most of our hirsute patients before we take them for treatment, which includes a, a serum testosterone total, a sex hormone binding globulin, and insulin fasting PP with GTT now because insulin levels are not very uh, you know, uh, reliable. We do not do FSH LH uh, uh, now because it has been found to be relatively unreliable. Uh, and a thyroid stimulation TSH, and in rare cases, a uh, uh, 17 hydroxy uh, progesterone, if we feel like that, if this misses anything out. But the basic panel is done. And as you said, uh, many a time you come across patients who do not have any biochemical abnormalities, but if we clinically feel that they have hyperandrogenism and they need to be treated for that, I usually give them uh, an anti-androgen like a spironolactone which I feel uh, works very well in patients who have this. Uh, uh, this is an entity called cutaneous hyperandrogenism, where you don't have any biochemical you know, marker, and, uh, but still the skin is, is hyperandrogenic and you have signs of right evident in front of your eyes. So these patients and the patients who do not do well, for example, with lasers, are put on uh, antiandrogens like spironolactone in spite of being biochemically uh, you know, normal. Uh, so this is this this is a clinical uh, diagnosis of hyperandrogenism, and we have to depend upon the clinical signs rather than the biochemical signs. Yeah, so I agree with you again uh, that we need to depend a lot even on clinical rather than uh, biochemical. But there are patients like say we follow this modified FG score is what is normally followed by everyone. Mm -hmm. But most of the patients will have already got themselves threaded, waxed, lasered, everything, and then come to us. So half the times we cannot make out that they have done something to themselves because it's so beautifully done by all of you that we don't realize that something is done. As a matter of fact, we put up a question because today with so many laser clinics being around and advertising so heavily, people have gone straight to the clinic, got their laser done, and then they will come to you for their other issues. So... But Ma'am, no matter what they do, if there's a hormonal issue, they're going correct. to come back with hair. That is the problem in our, in our laser practice. The patients who have that problem will not respond. They'll just come back with, this, with the problem. So within a month, if you call them back after a month, you'll know that she has hyperandrogenism. So I think that is an uh, area which probably as a dermatologist would think about. You know, that when would you say, okay, I've done enough lasers. Now I need to look into it. Because every patient is not investigated from day one. Okay, you've done a laser, you've found hirsutism, you have suspected PCOS, you haven't diagnosed it as yet. You have helped her because she's very distressed with all that hirsutism. But at which point in time do you feel it's necessary to investigate? After how many lasers? Doesn't it depend a little bit on the anagen phase and the uh, uh, growth of the hair? How fast it grows? It is not, uh, it is not the number of lasers. Uh, at the first instance, clinical history, extremely important. Family history, extremely important. Uh, drug history, extremely important. And the clinical signs, extremely important. So that will depict whether I have to investigate or not. Having said that, almost all my patients go for investigation before I take up uh, an LHR, in spite of they may not be showing other signs. Because if they have uh, signs of hyperandrogen in the form of uh, hirsutism, then they have an androgen excess, either an androgen excess or a, a hypersensitivity of the androgen receptors. So I, I get most of them investigated. And as far as lasers are concerned, uh, we now know over a period of maybe 
15, 20 years that we have been doing uh, laser hair reduction, we now know how a patient will behave. After about two or three sittings, there's a considerable delay between the, uh, you know, uh, between the sessions because people do not get regrowth. So if a patient is not doing well after two or three sessions, that is the time I would want to investigate if I have not done it by any chance at the beginning. Absolutely. So Karishma, what do you do? Ma'am, uh, I do a complete examination. I actually look out for this modified FG score and we write it down. And we explain, we show the chart to the patient as well. And uh, uh, we make them understand that this is a sign of underlying hormonal imbalance. And it's always better that we investigate uh, at the first visit itself. And then if they say, no, doctor, we would like to wait and uh, let, me, let us first start with the treatment, you know, all that. Then we have a one to one discussion and then we take a call. But most of the time, we try and get the investigation done in the first visit itself if we are suspecting a PCOD because that will guide our uh, you know further line of treatment whether we, if we have to give any anti-androgens if we have to give any other medications along with the lasers otherwise if we just start with the lasers and we don't start parallel treatment with the medicine they are never going to be happy. Lasers have been used for all kinds of patients there's a particular kind of page, uh, patient who may not respond well, especially the ones who are darker skin. I think they don't respond very well. Or is there, is there a different laser for different skins, Malvika? Sure. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Guru, um, Dr. Durusha, my um, uh, take is that hirsutism has become extremely complex to handle today uh, for many reasons. One is, uh, you know, you have patients who've already done many lasers come to you. Patients have taken medication with laser, anti-androgens with laser, uh, had a success and then come back with a relapse. So, and then you have some patients who have a biochemical abnormality where you're justified in giving anti-androgens. And then you have patients who have nothing like Dr. Uh, Anil said, and you know, the dichotomy is whether you should do laser hair removal or give them time with anti-androgens, then start. So really, I feel that as I look at it today, um, uh, thick dark hair responds to all types of lasers. So it's not your thick dark hair which is a problem. If you have darker skin, then the NDAG, uh, long pulse NDAG is safer if it has a good cooling device, with, uh, inbuilt cooling. And that's because it protects the epidermis and has a longer wavelength. Uh, now we have the multiple wavelength laser, the triple wavelength lasers, which overcome a lot of the uh, in uh, the problems that we face with laser hair removal in terms of efficacy. They're supposed to shorten the number of sessions. They also treat mixed hair. So the problem with hirsutism is also that you have amongst thicker, darker hair, you also have softer, finer hair, what we call the vellus hair or hypotrichosis. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you nowadays, uh, the multiple wavelengths are supposed to overcome that where three wavelengths are used. Uh, the NDA, NDA is good if you have darker skins. Uh, but it's also operator dependent. You know, the tool depends on the operator as well. So the, when you master your tool and your uh, device, you can always get good results. But we do find that in hirsutism, despite everything, you could be testing, could be doing the right laser, you could be giving the right caps, you yeah. do get resistant cases. You yeah. do get resistant cases. I did have a patient who came with a big scarf around her neck like this one day. And I said, why are you covering your neck? She opened it and she had black spots all over her neck. And she was so furious because that's what had happened to her after the laser. Now, why does that happen, Nina, when they do laser? Why do you get these spots in some patients? Not all, of course. Why does it? So what happens is, like, doc, like Malvika said, it's very operator dependent. So you have to know your laser physics very well. And if you don't choose your parameters well, vis-a-vis -vis the skin type and the hair type, you are definitely going to get burnt. And this happens especially with the diode lasers. Because with the diode lasers are beautiful lasers, but you have to be really very careful of careful. the parameters you're using. So if you're not uh, sharp with your laser physics and you don't evaluate the skin and the hair, oh, we have seen so many burns. Including yeah. with the IPL, including with the IPL. Including with yeah, the IPL, yeah. 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 So you, you have, have to be really how careful. How many laser machines in your office? I beg your pardon? How many laser machines in your office to take care of different skins? <laughs> I have three. <laughs> we have all, uh, at least because uh, most yeah. of us in laser practice yeah. have all, uh, all the wavelengths at least. We have multiple systems now. So how, many, how many are they? 
10? Uh, if we take all my lasers into account, I have around, yes, 10, 12 machines. Very good. There yeah. will be any place for the patients then, probably. <laughs> you know, and also it's body hair and it's facial hair. So you need lasers of different mm -hmm. hair types and also your volume of uh, laser hair removal, which, uh, uh, which also makes you, and also the need. I must tell you that uh, there are, when the, when the person, mm -hmm. person patient gets better, after about, you were asking a question, after the fourth to sixth session, if things are going right. Yeah. After the fourth to sixth session is when you know that you, you know, things are working. You know it. Yeah. And then what happens, the hair gets less thick and it goes into that zone where it's dark but final, but still not soft and fine. And that's when you can run into trouble. So sometimes we need to switch technology. So it's not that we just love our gizmos. It's yeah. that we need to teach technology. So the brain behind the machine rather than the machine. Yeah. I mean, it's your hands and your brain. Also the parameters. I think a lot. Too, Even the parameters. Even with the ultrasound sounds done. You see, we get so many ultrasounds today, which are, which are really crazy. It depends so much on who's the man behind the machine or the woman behind the machine to give you a good ultrasound report. So coming to insulin resistance, when we talk about acanthosis, I know that uh, metformin treatment is the ideal choice to be given. But suppose a patient cannot take um, you know, metformin, she can take a very small dose, or maybe she's not exercising even though we have told her to exercise. We've done everything possible. What else do you do for these patients? What else can you give to these patients? I think now the trend is, and we are also adopting it, is giving inositol. Hmm. So we're hmm. also using inositol in our practice because it also causes insulin sensitizing. And that hmm. seems to work quite nicely in the younger people. So, and they also tolerate it much better. They are happier when they're told that it's not a, it's not a diabetic drug. It's a vitamin type of agent. So mm -hmm. that is something which I go to. Okay. It, it it is like the, even the alpha, alpha lipoic acid. I think, uh, you know, N, uh, N, N cysteine. N acetyl cysteine. Vitamin D. Of that, alpha lipoic acid, uh, vitamin B6, and zinc, uh, along with also D3 and I. It is very important. D3 once a week for four to six weeks and every monthly, along with a combination of these. You know, the younger generation, I'm absolutely in agreement with Dr. Nina. It definitely helps mm. to cut the sugar craving, you know. And yeah. I tell them to take it right after the last bite of that meal. Mm. They must have it right after. And if you give it to them twice a day, when the sugar craving goes down, automatically things begin to go on the right track. Well, sugar is poison. Yeah. So, so, but I, think, Sorry. I, I think, Dr. Duru, um, the most important thing, it's not whether the patient agrees or not agrees. Uh, the most important thing in insulin resistance is uh, uh, lifestyle modification. You have to be very, very strict and harsh on yeah. this. <laughs> the parents are to be told, please don't come to me if you can't do this. Because if they don't do that, we can, can do nothing with insulin, insulin sensitization, you know. Uh, so we have to tell them 90% of your treatment is weight reduction, lifestyle modification, and only 10% is something that I can do. If you can, please do follow. If you can't, then you can't do, you can't do well. What do I do with my, uh, my install if, if she doesn't improve her lifestyle and lose weight? It doesn't work. That's where we need Tara to come in. Yes, absolutely. After hearing her lovely talk, I I, that's uh, what we need Tara I, to come in. Ma'am. Uh, yeah, I feel, ma'am, all of us in our clinic, we should have that, uh, you know, uh, body fat analyzer. It's a very simple machine. You just have to enter the certain things and you get, you know, spot on, you get your BMI. And that BMI can really scare them. A, a measuring tape, which just tells them about the base circumference. They say more than 80 centimeters in a female and more than 90 centimeters in a male. It's an indicator of metabolic syndrome. So if also, we can, you know, tell them all these things in our clinic itself and have a counselor in our uh, clinic, I think PCOD needs a lot of counseling. They, we really need to make them aware and care about the future uh, problems they can have. I totally also, agree with also you. Insulin. All our patients and uh, in short, we calculate the visceral fat also. Yes. Show them how yes. bad the visceral fat is and how it's going to affect your liver. Show them the yeah. fat liver on ultrasound and I think once we do these show it to them it makes a lot of difference I think we'll need to ask one more question on this insulin resistance is 
when patients have acanthosis uh, with metformin with the right dose, in how much time do you expect the acanthosis to disappear? And second is, what do you do with the skin tags that develop with acanthosis? Uh, uh, can I answer? Within, within a week or two, they start saying that after starting of metformin, they can actually feel feeling light in their weight. Hmm. That is the first. That is the first feedback. Feedback they give that feeling lighter and uh, appetite has reduced. The skin. I think it takes a couple of months to show the result. That's not so quick because it's a thick layer and it has to. We so generally do other combination of treatments. What is the combination treatment you use? So we do a combination of uh, chemical peels along with fractional laser. Mm-hmm. Okay. And topical creams like retinoids, alpha, alpha hydroxy acid, salicylic acid. We give a combination of all these along with a moisturizer. And uh, yeah, it takes a couple of months, but it doesn't go away completely. It takes a while for it to, but it fades away. Maybe 50 to 70% it gets better. Only if they are losing weight and uh, following the lifestyle modification. And the skin tags need anything? I think, uh, can I add to that, Dr. Guru? So uh, if you're starting metformin, the changes in the acanthos and ivicans is not before six to nine months. It takes very long yeah. for the changes to come. Yeah. Skin tags are very easy. We can remove them immediately yeah. in our clinics under local anesthesia. It's a very quick process. How but do you remove them? We, we, have, uh, we give them a little local. We have our hyphricators. We have our Elmen uh, radio frequency machines. You can just sort of get it out. But uh, what they are concerned more is about the darkening of the skin. And we know that insulin also stimulates insulin-like growth factor one, which exactly. is the one which is causing the thickness. Absolutely. So even yeah. if you are doing all these procedures, uh, it may not help them to get a consistent result. So we have to counsel them that your metformin is going to take you six to nine months. And it does. If you see the patient after nine months, they're definitely much better, even without mm. any procedures. Absolutely. Ask me, uh, I think the acanthosis nigricans improvement is directly related to the, their weight loss. So they weight lose loss. body yes. fat percentage and they go yes. down 3 kilos, 5 kilos, 8 kilos, 10 kilos. You'll just see the acanth yeah. acanthosis following exactly 3, 5, 8, 10. It's lighter, lighter, yes. lighter. Once they've dropped 5, then only mm -hmm. I have 5 kilos and the body fat percentage goes down, then I start procedure. Uh, I believe I believe I believe procedures and topical treatments are very useful and the patients who get them uh, improve very fast uh, and are very happy within a month or two months most of my patients see a diff change I don't have to wait for nine months for the metformin to work metformin will be on but uh, my my procedures and my topicals right from the beginning and I feel that within two months most of my patients will be very happy they won't be cleared completely but they'll be very happy yeah. about uh, about the improvement in the texture and the color absolutely yeah. I think uh, the the message going out is that patients who are insulin resistant either because of PCOS combined with obesity, with obesity, 80% of our patients are obese. It's the fat, which is internal fat, not the subcutaneous fat, which is known to be in causing insulin resistance. And by dropping the fat, you're lowering the insulin resistance. By dropping the insulin levels, which actually work as growth factors, you're, you're making the patient better. So in short, I think all this together works. Does any of you use any other combination with, uh, with medication with these patients besides the local therapies and metformin and whatever else? Anything else? Do you all tend to use uh, anti-androgens at the same time? Because we know hyperandrogenemia and insulin resistance go hand in hand. There are some people who use statins that are known to have some effect on androgens. So there are various uh, combinations people use. But I think what is important for us to know is that, uh, that uh, these combinations uh, also work with uh, mainly with hyperandrogen. So when we use uh, um, something like flutamide or finasteride or whatever other drug we use, all of them, of course, we need to be sure that it's safe to use it for them and evaluate them regularly before we can um, sort of keep continuing the drug. So we come to the last part is... I don't know how much time I have left, uh, but um, uh, in short, we will cover the alopecia part. Many women are having alopecia coming up, hirsutism on the face, 
but alopecia on the head. So how do we deal with alopecia? And this is something which I want to discuss in terms of um, one is that uh, how do you diagnose female pattern baldness? Second is how do you treat it? And uh, is it topical? Is it oral? What kind of therapy do, we, do you use as a dermatologist? Uh, uh, female pattern alopecia is a clinical diagnosis as we call it pattern. So if you have a pattern mm -hmm. of alopecia <laughs> where there is increase in the parting uh, in the center, and, the, and the, there is a recession of the hairline over the temples. And then there are other signs of hyperandrogenism, even if they are not, then, but still you have made a, uh, you will make a diagnosis of patterned alopecia. And when there is patterned alopecia, uh, it is called androgenetic, but, uh, but you know, uh, as, uh, it's not as proven in women as much as it is proven in men that it is an androgenic alopecia. So the 5-DHT pathway being involved in development of androgenic alopecia is fully proven in men, but not as much in women. So that's why finasteride is not very useful in women uh, as it is in men and is not the first line. There are several other pathways that have been thought of. But uh, having said that, but uh, anti-androgens do help and I depend more on spironolactone than on finasteride in women. Uh, in men, I give um, more preference to finasteride. And uh, we use topicals like minoxidil. We now have peptides, uh, uh, which help. And then we have some procedures also uh, uh, with which we can help these patients. So anyone else wants to add anything to whatever Dr. Anil has said? Yeah, I want to add. A, yeah. yeah, that in, uh, it's called, we call it female pattern hair loss because a lot of times we don't find any clinic, uh, biological evidence of hyperandrogenemia. And uh, there are three types of uh, uh, clinical appearances. One is you may have whitening of the parting. The other, may, you may have recession of the frontal. And third is you may have diffuse loss of hair. So there are three different types of part. Now, the most important diagnostic thing for female pattern hair loss is you use your dermoscope because you'll have a diameter variation in the yeah. hairs. So you'll see that more than 20% of the hairs will be thinner hairs. So when you have that diameter variation, you're a little more sure that this is more uh, female pattern hair loss and there's not other types of alopecia. So that dermoscopic examination is very important for evaluating that this lady has a female pattern. And we can show it to the lady also that see so many hairs are thinner. Also that normally you have uh, multiple hairs in clumps growing together in one follicle. So in female pattern hair loss, we'll have single sort of follicles mm -hmm. because they are now getting fibrotic and they are sort of disappearing. So you'll have single hairs in a follicle. So that is how we diagnose the female pattern hair loss. And mm -hmm. where therapy is concerned, of course, topical minoxidil is one of the things we have to go to. And then uh, you, of course, flutamide works very well, but again, you have to be careful about the hepatotoxicity. Uh, oral contraceptive pills combined with spironolactone also is very useful in female pattern hair loss. So uh, it has, it's a long, long haul. It's a yeah. slow process, but with a lot of hand-holding, but we do get, and as Dr. Anil said, there are a lot of procedures now, which mm -hmm. we actually, we can uh, do PRP, we can do microneedling, we can actually do, re we can do stem cell injections. So they also help to stimulate. I agree, we do it, but is it found to be really helpful? or It does help. I think we all have seen uh, very gratifying results with them. Yeah. Because you can't tell a 23-year-old who's so bald that we can do nothing for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. May I add a few words? Yeah, sure. You know, uh, when everything that Nina and Doc, Dr. Nina and Dr. Anil said is spot on with what we also, how we go about the analysis and approach, uh, I'd like to add, because there's so many viewers, that you know, when a young girl or even an older woman comes and says, I'm losing hair, you know, and you can't, you, you, you can't see much hair loss, actual hair loss. You can't dismiss it. Itching, dandruff, it doesn't go, follicular eruptions on the scalp. Women who say I lose every three months and then it stops and then it comes back. These all suggest patterns of scalp microfollicular inflammation and early hair loss, which could eventually develop into androgenetic alopecia. 
So we should start young. We should start in a preventive mode also. Then, of course, comes a developed pattern in the frontal area. And as discussed, definitely trichoscopy helps. But on treatments, I would like to say that, yes, spironolactone, but I have begun to find oral deuterosteride and oral minoxidil of value. But in select more advanced resistant cases, it's not my first line. So my first line would be spironolactone, finasteride, topical minoxidil. Now you get topical minoxidil with topical finasteride. And okay. those are, there are reports to show that they work. Growth factor peptides. These are also found to be very useful uh, in combination with minoxidil. And you can alternate them or you can use them depending on the severity. And uh, one of the newer techniques, apart from PRP as discussed by them, is dermal micrographs, where from the post-auricular area, we take small graphs and it's used in a, it's called regenerative, which even Dr. Anil does. And we use it also in females as well as in males for androgenetic alopecia. And in more advanced cases, resistant cases to finasteride, oral deuterosteride, with the same precautions as finasteride because it blocks the receptor one and two, and oral minoxidil, especially in dupa, the dupa patterns, the diffuse patterns, mm. Dr. Nina said, and also even in resistant female pattern alopecia, the newer approaches, which we are now adopting for resistant cases, even in younger girls. I think the only thing I'd like to add on is that when we are giving finasteride and deuterosteride, we have to be very careful in these sexually active girls because everyone is sexually active now. And unless you're protecting them with either a intrauterine contraceptive or you're giving them OCPs, it is a big risk factor. If they're married. Also, ma'am. Even married, if they get pregnant, you have yeah. a deuterosteride and all. As, and so the, you'll have...